like I say, we're here for bathing and sleep joining the dots. The idea of this session is that we take a closer look at some of the research links between bathing and sleep, but then also what that means. So why is sleep uh, important when we're considering maximizing people's independence and engagement in, uh, in meaningful activity? So the first bit of the webinar is very much about uh, what does the research say about the links between bathing and sleep, uh, but also not just bathing, but um, pass passive water um, and sleep. And the idea with that is to try and get us to start to think about what the evidence base is when we're making bathing recommendations. Are we thinking about bathing assessments in the way that we should? Or are we actually, are we applying the science and the research in the way that we should? Um, uh, and do we know what that, what that research is in the first place? So this is a starting point, and this, is, this sounds really straightforward, but in the past, obviously not in the last year, we haven't traveled around the country doing these sorts of sessions for Abacus. Um, but, but normally when we're doing those sorts of events, uh, there's a, a bit of a disparity about what people term to be bathing. Um, and even when we're doing supervision of, of OTs around, around the country, they'll, they'll use the umbrella term of bathing to mean bathing and, and showering or even just having a wash at the sink. So I just want to make it really clear that from a bathing perspective, when I talk about bathing, this is what I mean. And the definition is uh, a washing or immersion of something, especially the body in water for cleansing. So when I use the term bathing, I'm meaning somebody getting down in water. If I mean showering, I'll say showering specifically. And I want this to be our start, starting point um, because we'll go on to it a little later, but I think sometimes our perception of bathing and, and a bathing assessment is a little bit um, skewed or can be very different to how we might um, approach another kind of occupational focused assessment. So the World Federation say that in occupational therapy, occupations refer to the everyday activities that people do as individuals in families and with communities to occupy time and bring meaning and purpose to life. Occupations need to include, sorry, occupations include things people need to do, want to do, and are expected to do. And I wanna just have a little look at that last sentence, that need, want, and expectation. I think those three words are really important, particularly want and expectation, when we think of both empowering um, our clients, um, but also when we're working in what we may describe as needs-led services or what some people might describe as needs-led services. It's really important that when we're working in those services, how we continue to define ourselves as occupational therapists um, and, and ensure that we are um, applying our knowledge and skills. If we go back to that sentence, it's need, want and expectation. So we're not just looking at what people need, we're looking at what they want and what they expect. Um, and that could be socially, it could be within roles that they perform in any part of their life. It's need, want, and expectation. I think often there's a, again, we'll come on to it a little later, but there's a there's a the bit about uh, bathing and showering, which is about necessity and hygiene. Um, but the want and expectation are very important pieces for us to pick up on later. So I thought it was important just to clarify that and to revisit it at the beginning. So before we move into the research a part of the webinar, I just want to, to, to make people um, clear and reassured about what we're talking about. So we're going to focus on four bits of, of, of sleep-based research, so uh, bathing and sleep-based research. And there's not enough time in the, in the hour that we have to go into those bits of research in significant depth. Um, we could probably do a two-day course just on it if we're going to pick the bits of research apart. So what we do is we talk about the research, we talk about um, how they conducted their studies, and, and more importantly, what the findings were, but the links to those uh, bits of research are in the references at the end, so you can, you can take it upon yourself to, um, to do a bit more um, digging, a bit more uh, research into the, the, the research themselves to come to your own conclusions. I hope that's okay with everyone. So the first bit of research we're going to look at, it was conducted by Murphy in 1997. Now this bit of research um, isn't uh, bathing specific. So this is about body temperature and sleep onset. Um, 
it's important for us to know what the outcome of this was though, so that we uh, can apply it to some of the later research. It makes, it, it makes the understanding of the next bits of research um, easier. So like I say, this was research investigating the relationship between body temperature and sleep onset. Um, they had 44 participants between the ages of 19 and 82. They were in a 72 hour controlled and continuous monitoring environment where um, body temperature and brain activity using EEGs were monitored. And they determined that the maximum rate of body temperature reduction occurred 44 to 60 minutes prior to sleep onset. And that's, that's important when we come to further research about bathing and sleep later. So from their 72 hour study, there was a fluctuation in body temperatures through the day and the maximum rate of body temperature reduction occurred 44 to 60 minutes prior to sleep onset. And that's important for us to hold on to. So the next bit of research I want us to, to, to cover briefly is, um, was conducted by Kanda in Japan in, in 1999. And this one, this study is the investigation of the effects of bathing uh, and sleep quality. Um, there were two different age groups, 65 to 83 and 17 to 22. And both groups at various times in the study, um, the recordings were taken with bathing and without bathing to determine whether bathing had an impact on the quality of, of their sleep. And that included the empirical data. They determined that the mean body temperature after somebody bathed was 0.7 degrees higher than with no bath. And the mean skin temperature increase was 1.5 degrees. So the people who bathed, as you'd probably expect their skin temperature increased, but so did their overall body temperature. The outcome of that research was that the groups who bathed had reduced sleep onset latency. So that's the time between bathing and going to sleep. Um, so they went to sleep quicker, basically. There was an increase in total sleep time. There were reduced body movements in the first three hours of sleep. And rhetorically, so the qualitative data that they recovered from the participants was that they felt like they had a better quality of sleep. Interestingly, and I was surprised by this, the, the impact on the older age group was actually more significant. So the, the, the older group, um, the older people in the, um, within the groups, the, the impact of bathing um, empirically and qualitatively had it demonstrated more signif a more significant impact, um, which is interesting because in my clinical experiences, we seem to consider bathing a lot and a lot more and quite reasonably for children. But within our more elderly client groups, we seem to be making a much quicker jump to showering. And it's really interesting to think, well, if, the, if, if this bit of research identified that actually the impact of bathing was greater for the older groups, then why are we not applying that information in the same way across all age groups? Um, I touch on that, touch on that a bit later, but just that's an interesting point to reflect on. So I think it is something that we do relatively well for children, and again, we'll come back to that. This bit of research conducted by Diller in 2019 is a systematic review of passive water to aid sleep-based research. So it isn't research, it isn't um, uh, research conducted in its own right. It's a systematic review of, of other bits of research that were doing the same thing. So they considered, considered sleep onset latency, wake after sleep onset, total sleep time, sleep efficiency, and subjective sleep quality. Uh, you'll see if you, if you delve into this in a bit more detail, what research criteria they, they put into their systematic review, but ultimately 17 research articles met the criteria with comparable data. The outcomes of that systematic review were really interesting. So they were able to determine more specifics about making recommendations about how bathing supported sleep. 
because of the number of bits of research that they, they gathered. So they were able to collate that, that data to come up with some quite specific points um, that until I started looking into this research, I didn't know myself um, about and what conditions do does bathing support sleep. And they said that the, a water temperature of 40 to 42 degrees maximizes the opportunity for bathing to increase sleep quality. They said that the bath should be scheduled one to two hours before bedtime. And that starts to figure in to some of the timings that we briefly touched on in the very first bit of research about the body temperature reduction. So we'll make those links in just a second. So at the minute, we've got 40 to 42 degrees um, water temperature scheduled one to two hours before bedtime. And it can have an effect with as little, a positive effect on sleep with as little as, as 10 minutes bathing. Now, you could say that that's not uh, a huge group of bits of research to, to, to collate data on 17. It's enough to come up with those conclusions, but it isn't, it isn't huge. So if we were gonna critique that, we might need to look at how, uh, how consistent that is. So Diller's research in the systematic review in March of 2019 was taken on further um, by the University of Texas later that year. So in July 2019, the University of Texas with Diller expanded that research. So they looked at over 5,000 water-based passive body heating studies. Uh, actually it was 5,300 and something. So well over 5,000. And they corroborated those conclusions. So they said that bathing 90 minutes, so it's in between the one and the two. So they said that bathing 90 minutes before sleep at 40 to 42 degrees with 10 minutes plus of bathing had the impact that Kanda suggested. So it's an extension of Diller's review um, and I think, given the number, gives it more validity. So why is that the case? And the University of Texas research went further in its conclusions to say that bathing in those conditions was impacting on the circadian rhythm. So for those of you who don't know what the circadian, a circadian rhythm is, it's a natural internal process that regulates the sleep wake cycle and repeats roughly every 24 hours. They regulate the body's internal systems and in people coordinate mental and physical systems. So it doesn't have to be about the sleep uh, wake process. A circadian rhythm can be anything that cycles within a 24 hour period, roughly 24 hour period. But undoubtedly the sleep wake cycle is the most well known and established of those. The circadian rhythm, it says, can be influenced by the environment. So a good example of that is um, somebody who works night shifts, say for example. So we have a natural circadian sleep-wake rhythm, but that rhythm is altered in that instance by people changing their time of, of, of sleep. Their, their routines and habits change and therefore their circadian rhythm changes. If I were to go and do a night shift somewhere, then the chances are between two and four o'clock, I would be desperate to go to sleep. So my body is telling me that's when I should have its deepest sleep because I'm not, my circadian rhythm is designed around relatively normal um, uh, hours, sleep hours. Although I'm sure it wasn't when, uh, when children were young, I'm sure we've all had those experiences. So the most well-known of those circadian rhythms is the sleep wake cycle. And it's about that uh, normal standard time of waking and sleep on a, uh, within a normal 24 hour period. And what happens, and this is why we make the links to the first bit of research and about the body temperature reduction. So the circadian rhythm within the sleep wake cycle, the core body temperature lowers to induce sleep, which was highlighted in Murphy's research. So as you go through the day, and you feel tired, you can start to feel a little cold. Um, 
And that's your body's way of starting to induce sleep. As you go through the day, your body core body temperature will slightly reduce. And we're talking, uh, you know, points of a degree, but your core body temperature reduces. And if we've ever been in a position where we've been absolutely exhausted for whatever reason, we haven't slept for a few nights um, and you're feeling dreadful, you're feeling cold and shivery, your body, your circadian rhythm is trying to force you into sleep by reducing the body temperature so that you have to lie down and sleep. And that's why you feel cold and shivery. What the research is showing is that bathing in, in that environment is altering or impacting, probably more accurately, the circadian rhythm. So bathing in the conditions specified in the research increases the core body temperature, as Kanda highlighted. So it's bringing the core body temperature up by, I think it was 0.7 degrees, and the skin temperature by 1.4 or 5 degrees, as it was. When you get out of the bath, that then causes a more rapid reduction in body temperature because your starting point was higher than it was previously. And that more rapid reduction in body temperature and skin temperature induces sleep more quickly. Um, and then the qualitative data suggests that um, the person then feels like they've had a better sleep. That's backed up by the quantitative data um, for things like body movement, um, REM, which all seem to suggest that people who've bathed and have altered, have impacted their circadian rhythm in that way, has increased the quality of sleep. It's really interesting to think how we could use that for our clients, for people who have altered sleep patterns or um, have um, uh, night, night care needs, for example, regardless of age, is there anything we can use within the, the environment to support a healthy routine? Um, have we considered bathing in that way before? It's interesting. So once we start to appreciate the research on bathing uh, and the evidence base to support bathing before sleep, but we start to consider the impact of sleep that, in, that sleep has on our clients and their, their carers, their parents, and their ability to engage in uh, meaningful and purposeful occupations. So sleep itself should be seen as a meaningful occupation. We need to consider the impact of sleep um, on our clients' daily lives. So we're covering what can we do to improve sleep and hopefully highlighting some of the evidence around how bathing supports sleep. But then from an occupational therapist's perspective, how does sleep impact on, on occupational performance, safety and independence, which is ultimately what, what we're there for. We're doing this webinar today to support World Sleep Day, um, which is on, on Friday. And the slogan for World Sleep Day this year is regular sleep healthy future. Um, world Sleep Day is a call to all professionals to advocate and educate the world about the importance of sleep for achieving an optimal quality of life and improve global health. So it's a really good link in to what we're gonna talk about next. We've covered bathing, we've covered what the evidence says about bathing supporting sleep. And now we'll look at some of the, the areas about why sleep is important. So firstly, education. So a 2014 American Academy of Pediatrics technical report states that chronic sleep loss and associated sleepiness and daytime impairments in adolescents are a serious threat to the academic success, health and safety of our nation's youth and important public health issue. The document and the research around that again is in the references for you. But what it shows is that a good night's sleep is essential for learning new information and remembering it later. So uh, elements such as enhanced attention, procedural memory, declarative memory, problem solving skills, improved recall, are all seen to have uh, been improved when somebody has a good night's sleep. In fact, the study shows that um, there was a school, there were a number of schools in the US who, as part of a trial, changed their school-based routines to allow the children to have a longer lie-in. Um, so they came to school later, they fit school finish time at, ended at the same time. So actually the school day was shorter. The children started school later and it came with certain conditions with the parents. So about bedtimes and what time the children had to go to bed. 
but it was able to demonstrate by changing that routine and allowing the children to start school later that they had in, an increase in academic success. It's a really interesting study and definitely worth having a look at. So we're linking there potentially bathing with sleep. Hopefully we're, we're demonstrating that and then sleep and improved educational outcomes. Behaviour, I love that picture. This reminds me of all my boys as they've been grown up. Um, inadequate sleep causes everyone, including children, to be biased towards seeing the world in a more negative light and less in a positive one. Even more, inadequate sleep causes problems relating, regulating the ups and downs in mood, leading to wider and more rapid reactions to relatively minor events. And that's from Dr. Dean Beebe, who's the director of neuropsychology program at Cincinnati Children's Hospital. Um, Dr. Jody Mindell, the associate director of the sleep center at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia adds, children who don't get sufficient sleep at night are more likely to be overactive and non-compliant, as well as being more withdrawn and anxious. So they're suggesting that sleep and behavior have a bi-directional relationship. Again, the links to their articles are in the references at the end. I think the, the sleep and physical health links are quite well established. Um, and I, there's, there's links in the references at the end. And we're not going to talk about physical health a lot within sleep because we tend to understand them a little more, bit more. Rhetorically, we understand the impact between sleep and, and the digestive system and um, on, on the cardiac cycle, on blood pressure and heart rate, on diabetes, all those sorts of things, and obesity. So we're not gonna touch on them much here, um, but the evidence for them or some of the articles and some of the, uh, the NHS links for sleep and physical health, health are again in the references at the end. The research is pretty well established about the links between sleep and physical health. So sleep and mental health, the same bi-directional relationship that I mentioned earlier could definitely be sent, said of, of sleep and mental health. Take, for example, depression. While a depressed young person may sleep less well and or have altered recall of sleep duration and quality, they may all be also be disposed to develop depression because of sleep deprivation. There's no link between sleep loss and increased suicidality in, in adolescents. Now it's difficult um, for me at any time in reading the research, but certainly now to unpick the chicken and egg part of that, um, but there are definite links. As a parent, I'm a, certainly aware of the impact on my own mental health of the children as they've been growing up, where say they've been teething and you feel like you haven't had sleep for, for three or four nights and everything around you feels like it's a bigger issue. You, you feel like you don't want to get dressed. I felt like I'm, I'm not gonna have a shave. I just, or, or get washed in the same way. I just can't be bothered. And that impacts your social contact and everything feeds into an overall picture of mental health. And that's because I've been sleep deprived, not for anything else, just sleep deprived. Um, so, the, I, I'm sure in those situations, um, people can understand those direct links. Dr. Sally Hobson, a speciality community pediatrician, says that clinicians who are trained to work in mental health settings are well placed to assess and consider sleep problems as part of their formulation. In addition, the systematic, the systemic thinking, she suggests that any clinician working with children and young people in a physical or mental health development setting, she actually goes on to clarify anybody at any age in those settings, should have a basic knowledge of the importance of sleep, of how to take a basic focused sleep history, talk with families and young people about the importance of sleep, give basic advice on sleep hygiene and behavioral interventions for sleep, and most importantly, to support a family and young person through making any necessary changes. So what we're trying to do is to provide you with the information to be able to help those families make those necessary changes. Are they aware of the links between bathing and sleep and then bathing, sorry, and then sleep and mental health or physical health or behavior or education? If you're not, they're unlikely to know them. So it's really important that we inform ourselves so that we can inform them. 
play, um, there will be more uh, informed people than me watching this webinar who, who know the links between play uh, and development. Um, I, I, I haven't got a, a huge pediatric history, so we're not going to dwell on this an awful lot. Um, but those of you who are watching who have those clinical backgrounds will understand. Now, I've included play. Um, firstly, just I think sometimes we need to remember that Article 31 of the United Nations Convention on the Rights of a Child says that play is a human right. Now, I'm not suggesting that bath time is the only time where somebody might be able to play. You would very much hope not. But I know bath time, certainly within my family, um, as, as the children have been young, has definitely been a, about play and other things have been a byproduct of play. So it's really important that we think about, certainly for children, bathing and play, but also take that one step further within our adult client groups and think, okay, play might not be the same thing, but um, why is it important? If, if as a child you get in the bath to play and splash and have as much water on the floor as is in the bath in the first place, certainly in my experiences, then what do we get from bathing as we get older? What does it become about? But remembering that for children, uh, play is a, is a human right. And if there are families that you're working with where play is significantly limited, play opportunities are significantly limited, then bath time is, uh, is one of those things that you might be able to, to have some control over. Um, so routine, um, we've covered a bit about the, the circadian process and obviously you can find out more about it, but the circadian process is very much about routine and you can alter it through routine. We've covered that a, 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 a bit. And in fact, the NHS website suggests that using bathing as part of a child's nighttime routine, um, you, should, you, you should consider using bathing as part of a nighttime routine. And I think whether we know why or not, it's something that certainly as parents or as, um, as aunties and uncles and people who might look after children, um, or when you, you know, certainly when you were children yourselves, we accept it's, 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 more, it's a more normal, we, we perceive it to be part of a more normal um, child's routine. Um, it's certainly always been part of the routine for, for, for my family and, and for my children. But without me really giving much consideration as to, as to why that is. So I didn't understand the links between bathing itself and sleep. I was just seeing it purely as routine. That being said, it is more well established in the children in children's services, in my experience, um, as it's perceived to be more supported by legislation, I think sometimes, um, for, such as the, the, the Children's Act, which states that local authorities provide services to minimize the effect on disabled children of their disabilities and give such children the opportunity to lead lives that are as normal as possible. And we generally accept that bathing is a normal routine for children. The perception of that, of course, isn't correct. Um, it, it, it's correct for children, but our perception that, that it's just children isn't correct. Um, and it, it, it certainly made it, it made me reflect on what questions I ask when I'm conducting a bathing assessment in the past, or indeed have I let people down in the past when conducting a bathing assessment because I've asked the wrong questions um, and focused on the wrong things. There is of course legislation that supports bathing adaptations for adults. Uh, including the CARE Act, so under section one states that local authorities uh, states that the primary objective is to promote individual well-being, including personal dignity, physical and mental health and emotional well-being, control by the individual over their day-to-day -day life, including over care and support or support provided to the individual and the way in which it's provided, participation in work, education, training or recreation, domestic, family and personal relationships, and the suitability of living accommodation. We could pick out all of those points, so A to F from that Care Act section one, and think the things that we've talked about around education, behavior, work, because of memory, uh, cognitive function, um, our overall mental health, our physical health, they're all things that feed in 
to those points A to F within the Care Act. It goes further by stipulating that in exercising its function, local authority must have regard to the following matters in particular. And I find these really interesting. Again, thinking about how we link it to our need, want and expectation. And it says that we must consider the importance of, of beginning with the assumption that the individual is best placed to judge their own well-being needs. And that's a really interesting concept. And one that we might know it says in the act, but how do we apply it? So it says that the person themselves, the starting assumption is that the person themselves is best placed to be giving judgments about their well-being, how their well-being can be maintained. And then in B, it says the individual's views, wishes, feelings, and beliefs. So views, wishes, feelings, and beliefs. And we started the webinar by talking about need, want, and expectation. So there's a, a very clear link there between how we define occupation and therefore what we are engaged in as occupational therapists and this piece of legislation. So the legislation essentially is saying within bathing and sleep, we can, there is a legislative um, link there for us to be recommending bathing to support sleep because sleep then impacts on education, work, mental health, physical health, behavior, all of those things that we've previously talked about. So use the wording in the legislation to support the recommendations. And the next bit, the, the, the other bit that I've talked about um, is the Housing Grants Construction and Regeneration Act, which is where we get DFG from. Um, and it says that DFG derives and states out the purposes for which an application of grant must be approved, subject to the provisions are facilitating access by the disabled occupant to or providing for the disabled occupant a room in which there is a bath, shower, or both, or facilitating the use by the disabled occupant of such a facility. In my experience, legislation can often be perceived as restrictive, uh, whereas if we understand the language and its purpose, it's almost certainly supportive and enabling. So understanding that it says um, bath, shower, or both, is really important because then for our clients, we should be thinking, what, what, what can I recommend and legislate for? And if there is a distinct need for bathing and showering for either the client themselves or for other people in the home, then legislation supports it. The Royal College of OT's um, guidance states that the Care Act provides more opportunities for you as occupational therapists to re-establish many of the central tenets of the profession. The wholeness of the individual being led by their chosen goals, the use of their strength to achieve their goals, and the centrality of occupation to well-being. They conclude that... The link between housing, health and well-being is increasingly acknowledged by the government and DFGs are key within this. It believes that all DFGs may be seen as a key preventative measure at any stage of intervention, supporting independent living and reducing the impact of age, illness or disability. So when we're thinking about how we use, how we apply an evidence base to support bathing and sleep, we've got um, HGCR, we've got the Care Act, We've got the RCOT guidance there for children. You've got the Children's Act and um, potentially the, um, the, the Human Rights Act if, if you're going to apply it in that way. Supported by the evidence of research, which shows that bathing helps sleep, which helps all of these other things that we're supporting our clients to engage in. So I'm hoping we're starting to make those links. So thinking about our client groups then, moving on from the information and the research, can you, can you consider if someone or a child you were caring for was more alert, more able to risk assess, less challenging? I've used the word challenging in inverted commas because I think people will just understand what I mean. I don't particularly like the word, but um, I hope it just reflects um, or, or clearly identifies what, what I'm talking about. And we're more engaged in meaningful activity. If we're the occupational therapist supporting families of, of young children, adolescents, young adults or older adults in any shape or form but to engage more in meaningful activity. And we were able to make 
recommendations based on clear research and evidence supported by legislation. And it did those things It helped the person in those ways. How would that make you feel? I think it would be, I think it would be, a, you know, it, it have a huge impact on those people's lives. So hopefully we can use this information and apply it more regularly within our practice. The next question is, is an important one. And, and obviously you can't, in, in a room when I do this, we can get some answers and, and uh, uh, some physical answers and, and, and have some discussion about it. So it's more of a reflective question. What do you look at when addressing bathing difficulties with your, with your clients? Now, I can talk about my own experiences and my experience certainly when I was um, uh, working in statutory services was that I considered a bathing assessment when I look back and reflect on it as a transfer assessment. So I was very much looking at um, how do you safely get in and out of the bath and how can I support that? I definitely didn't consider it as an occupation focused assessment. And I didn't ask somebody why, I asked them how. And that's a very clear distinction. So in my experience, experience when I asked this question around the country, the people have those shared experiences. So I don't think I'm speaking out here. And I think a lot of the people on the webinar will have the same experiences. So we're often looking at um, how can we help somebody get in and out and actually not asking why is bathing important to you? What, what does it do for you? Um, it's very rare when you ask those questions that actually somebody says, I get in the bath to get washed. Washing is often a byproduct of being in the bath. And they're in there for a very different reason, either to be as a mother or father if they're going in with a young child or to support their mental health if they use the bath to unwind and relax, um, to reduce pain if, if um, they feel like it supports with joint or muscular pain. Normally, it's around roles or around mental health are the answers that I get. And therefore, if they're the answers that I get when I ask that question, or when I ask OTs what, what, why they bathe, then why are we not asking those questions to our clients more frequently? And that would certainly help us focus on bathing as a meaningful occupation. At the minute, what we tend to be doing is treating it as a transfer assessment. And then when something becomes quite complex or it can't be managed with standard equipment, whether that be through a loan store or off the shelf, we then make that jump to showering. Um, for the purpose of balance, what I need to say is that some of the research that I've put the links for also use showering within the research. So it's showering and bathing. Um, but I've used bathing as the outcome here because they all showed that bathing had the, had the greatest outcome. There were, there were some elements that improve showering, things like skin temperature, um, but not core body temperatures. Therefore, the impact was, was slightly reduced. And they had difficulty controlling the water temperature because by the time it got to the, to the, to the person showering, the temperature had obviously changed. So they were suggesting that bathing was, um, not only did it have the biggest impact, it was the easiest to control. But within this part of the discussion, we make that jump to showering because of perceived complexity. But what would that jump, what would that feel like to yourselves if you are somebody who bathes with a young child um, or, um, or you use it as part of your mental health routines, if somebody then all of a sudden said, oh, we're gonna to have to take that out because I can't support you that anymore and you're gonna to have to have a shower. Yes, you'd get clean, but what would the impact be on your, your holistic health and well-being? That's the question we need to ask. So I'm aware of time, so hopefully we'll have time for a few questions. Um, so in summary, we've covered the occupation of bathing and hopefully they're just reinforced the sorts of questions that we should be asking. It's why, not how. Um, and that leads to a client-centered approach to bathing. So what is bathing to the person? It needs to be an occupation-focused assessment. So again, asking that feeds back into the same thing. Us not thinking of, um, of it as a, bit, as a transfer assessment, but also thinking of need, want, and expectation. So it's not just about what do you need. The, the, the washed might be need, but actually want and expectation are two very different things. And I'm hoping we've started to cover there the, the significant relationship between bathing and sleep and provided you with some research uh, to, to get your teeth into in a bit more detail in the future. So thank you very much for listening to that. I really appreciate your time. There's a link there on that slide, which um, I'm sure Samantha's had questions about. 
certificates and I probably should have said it at the beginning, but you can use this link to take you to the Abacus Academy website where you can fill in a really basic form just to say that you've listened, you attended the webinar and then you'll, you'll have a certificate sent out to you in the next couple of weeks. So um, hopefully that helps. Um, 